There's a lens change in Romans chapter 6. Let me read you this from verse 3. Do you not know that all of us who've been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death. So that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if and we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. Now, if we've died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again, death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. That's a lens change. What does it mean? It means that God is not dealing with your sin right now because he's already dealt with it. It means the answer to your sin is that God said you are dead. He didn't want to bring you new life in Christ and then be working on your old life to try and improve it and make it better. Your old self was too bad to be cleansed and renewed. It had to be crucified because nobody in the Godhead wanted the job of pastoring your old nature. What they wanted was to create a whole new life, a whole new you, and take the old nature and the old man and put it in the grave and say, it's dead, it's finished, it's over great headstone love that headstone and now we've we've got rid of the things that we don't like about you and now we're causing you to be made a different man you're going to be born again and become a totally new person and we are only working on the new you the true you the real you that's in Jesus because the old you is dead so nudge your neighbor and say You look dead to me. (laughs) Some of you might be enjoying that a little bit too much. It's a major lens change when you understand that all of your struggles actually belong in the grave that God doesn't want to work on them. He just wants to say to you, no, excuse me, um, we, we killed all of that off and we gave you this new life. So uh, we are not working on sin. We are working on your righteousness. So when someone comes to me, you know, and says, Graham, you know, um, If you and I are going to get to know each other, then you need to know some things about me. And then they start talking about their their problems with with this and problems with that, and I'm angry about this thing and angry about that. My first question is, hang on a minute, time out. I, I have a question. Which self is talking? Is this your old self talking or your new self talking? Just so I know, who I'm buying a coffee for. (laughs) Which self is talking? Because here's the thing, if this is your old self, I am not interested. Because I have this aversion to speaking to corpses. (laughs) So I don't want to talk to you about your baggage. I don't want to talk to you about your past. I don't, want to, I don't want to talk to you about your old man or your old nature or any of that. I want to find where is the new man because I want to have a conversation with that person. And if you want to have a conversation with me, you're going to have to change that lens. 
because we can't go anywhere in this conversation because the problem isn't that you have these issues. The problem is your perception of yourself. You don't realize that all of that is dead. God took everything that was against you, wrote it on a piece of paper, nailed it to a cross, and says, we're actually going to take that into the grave with Jesus, and we're going to leave it there because this is who you really are. What does that mean? It means then when God looks at you, he doesn't see anything wrong with you. He only sees what's missing from your relationship with him, and he's totally committed to giving you that encounter. That means when the Holy Spirit puts his finger on a part of your life that's not working, what he's doing is he's pointing joyfully to the sight of your next miracle. And he's saying, let's bring some newness of life here. He's not saying, well, let's just help you with that problem and and, and we'll see if we can sort you out. He's saying, no, I am going to take that old thing that you don't want, and we are giving you this new thing which we want you to have, and this is what we're working on. So we'll take responsibility for this. You need to take responsibility for that. That's an ongoing lens change. And so in Ephesians 4, 20 to 24, it says this to us. It says, put off the old man. It's like, take it, put it off. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new man. There's nowhere where it says that you have to work on your old man. It says put it off because it's dead. Don't have anything to do with it. We're not working on it. We're not trying to clean you up. This is not behavior modification. Because if it is behavior modification, then Jesus needn't have died. Right? So God is saying, we are not working on that, so you put it off. Let's touch up your thinking because you need to see yourself differently. You need to start thinking the way that we think about you. And we believe that you are a new man in Christ. We believe that you are a new creation. All the old things have passed away. Everything has become new, and all those things are of God. That's what heaven is believing about you. So you be renewed in the spirit of your mind so you can put on the new man. That is a lens change. That I don't have to work on my old stuff because God has already worked on it. He shot it in the head. You are deader than last year's Christmas turkey. You are as dead as dead can be. And God is not interested in resurrecting your old nature so that he could wash it up and cleanse it and try and renew it. He said, forget that. That's dead. You put that off because we're not dealing with it. You put this on because this is what we're dealing with. And you realize that God is not dealing with sin. He's dealing with our righteousness. He's establishing righteousness and holiness as part of our lifestyle. When you are transformed by the renewing of your mind, you think like a saint not like a sinner. And our lens here is we have the mind of Christ. That means there's something, there's a better way of thinking about something, there's a better way of seeing about something, and that's why we're given a helper. The Holy Spirit is not here to help us with our old nature, He's here to help us with our new one. He's here to help us to see differently, help us think differently, help us to have a better confession, help us to walk this thing through in all of our circumstances so that we are rejoicing in the fullness and the abundance of who Jesus really is for us. He's making us in the image of God, which is the primary purpose of the Holy Spirit, is to make sure that Genesis 1.26 comes into fruition and reality in our lives. Let us make man in our image because he's pretty clear that he doesn't want to be made in yours. And we're learning about grace in that context then. 
You see how one lens change leads to another, leads to another, leads to another. And so then we start learning about grace because grace is the place in which we stand before God as we are being transformed. So grace actually covers anything that we might be doing wrong, any wrong perception, any wrong thinking, any default position. We are covered by the grace of God as we are learning how to become Christ-like. So we're learning that grace is not undeserved favor. Because that perception only works if we are governed by the old man and we need some undeserved favor. But the reality is we are in Christ and Christ is in us. And as far as I understand it, he deserves everything. The Bible actually said that Jesus grew in grace with God and man. So if grace is undeserved favor, what's he doing with it? You ever ask that question? If grace is undeserved favor, then Jesus never had any. But the Bible says that Jesus had grace. He was given grace. He received grace. So it has to be more than undeserved favor. So what is it? I think grace is this. I think grace is the empowering presence of God to enable us to become the people that God sees when he looks at us. So God sees you in a particular way. He sees you in Jesus. He put you into Jesus so he could always have a brilliant opinion of you. So he sees you in Jesus and grace is his empowering presence to enable you to become what he sees when he looks at you. That deserves more than a golf clap. The Bible says that we are a dwelling place of God by the Spirit, Ephesians 2.22. That's a lens change. What does that mean? It means that we are no longer part of a visitational process. We're not part of a visitational culture. We are a new creation never seen in the earth before Jesus. Because prior to Jesus, everyone lived in a visitational context because God could come on you, he could lift off you. He could come on you with his power, he could lift off you into, if you were sinful or disobedient. It's a visitational culture. God came and visited, but he wasn't present all the time. And now suddenly in Jesus, now, um, we don't have God coming upon us anymore. We have God living on the inside of us. We are in Christ and Christ is in us. We have a habitational culture. So now we carry the presence of God. But it's fascinating, you know, that when you don't really believe that, you start acting out of a visitational culture and you start praying, you know, and you invent... Uh, you invent ministries like, let's be desperate for God. What's desperation for God? It's somebody who doesn't really know what God has done, doesn't really know who God is for them, and they don't get it that they're no longer a visitational culture. They are a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. So I want you to know I am not remotely desperate for God. I'm too busy enjoying being delighted in him. So when you understand that you are a habitation of God, he's in you, he's dwelling in you, he is abiding in you, and abiding is the key New Testament discipline. When you get that, it changes your whole lens in terms of how you pursue God. And when the Bible says, you know, seek the Lord, what it really means is, Whatever situation you're going in, stop for a moment, give yourself a time out and look around and find where God is standing in your situation and move towards him. Go seek his presence in that situation. Go seek his presence in that circumstance. And how about this? Go seek his presence in that other believer. Because you might just find something different, eh? 
How do you seek the Lord when he never leaves you nor forsakes you? Come on, that's a good question, eh? And you can answer it when your lens has changed. We're seeking his presence in our circumstances. We're seeking a greater reality of who he is. We know he's here. I just want to seek more of him. I want to see more of his face. I want to interact with him in a greater way because I know it's possible because he's in me. He's here. I'm not seeking him because I'm lost or because he's not found. I'm seeking him because I know he's here and I want more of him And this situation is guaranteed to give me more of God. I just need to seek his presence. So we're learning how to be presence oriented. That's living in the presence internally. That needs a lens change. I was uh, visiting a friend of mine a while back, a guy called Steve, and he's, he's got two young daughters, four years old and six years old at the time. And uh, we're chatting away, and he gets a phone call. He's, he looks at it and says, Graham, sorry, I've got to take this call. I said, oh, no worries. So he goes out the room. So I'm watching the two girls playing with their dolls, kneeling on the floor and so on. And um, the six-year-old says to the four-year-old, hey, we're going to church tomorrow. The four-year-old, just playing with the doll, says, doesn't even look up, says, we don't go to church, we are the church. She says... We don't go to church, we are the church, that's because we're in the kingdom. And the six-year-old says, what's the kingdom? And the four-year-old says, the kingdom is the rule of heaven here on earth. That's when you realize there is no junior Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit that can talk to an apostle can talk to a four-year-old girl. And so Steve's come back in. I said, you'll never guess what M just said. He said, what? Tell me. And I, I tell him the conversation, and he just nods and says, the Holy Spirit's been all over her for the last two months. And she's hearing things and seeing things. And you know what? When she says something, we check it out in the Scripture, and we change our lens. <laughs> what is she getting? She gets it that the church comes out of the kingdom because the kingdom cannot come out of the church. One is governed by the other. Church and kingdom are not the same. One is governed by the other. The kingdom is prime and unchanging, but the church is fluid, flexible, and constantly needing to be upgraded. Jesus coming from heaven to earth brings us the lens of on earth as it is in heaven. And, and he prays it in the Lord's Prayer. John, the disciple whom Jesus loves, picks up the same theme and demonstrates that same lens in 1 John 4, 17, when he says, as he is, so are we in this world. In other words, the lens of, G- of John mirrors the lens of Jesus. And it's important that our lens lines up with the lens that God has about the body of Christ, about you being a habitation, about the mind of Christ, about you being a part of the kingdom, that our lens has to line up with him. And if it doesn't, he's not changing. There's a reason why he says, I am the Lord, I don't change. But he pretty much changes everybody he comes into contact with. 